Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'll call the Tuesday, April 19th, 2011 meeting of the Iredale County Board of Commissioners to order. At this time, I'll ask Commissioner Renee Griffith to give our invocation, please, ma'am. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have to serve you and to serve this county. We pray that you give us wise decisions, give us wisdom to make wise decisions. We pray for our servicemen and women that are across this country and in foreign lands serving, that you will protect them. And we also pray for our leaders at the state and at the national le level, that you will also give them wisdom to make wise decisions for our country. We thank you for the freedoms that you have given us, and we do not take those freedoms lightly tonight as we're able to meet and assemble without fear. We thank you for the blessings that you have blessed this country and our county. Again, we pray for wisdom, and we ask all these things in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Join us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Before uh, we get to the adjustments of the agenda, I'll, I do want to say one thing. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a commissioner sitting up here tonight with a leg broken in two places. And if this is not a dedicated public servant, I've never seen one. Thank you, Mr. Norman. I appreciate that dedication. Appreciate that. I've always said you were a tough old coot, and tonight you proved it. But thank you for being here. Mr. Mashman, are there any adjustments of the agenda? Mr. Chairman, the only adjustment I have is to remove uh, the closed session at the uh, end of the agenda. Uh, other than that, I don't have anything to, uh, to adjust. Okay. Any adjustments of the agenda coming from the board? If not, a motion is in order for adoption of this agenda. Do I hear a motion? Motion to approve. Motion to approve from Mr. Norman. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. We have presentations of special recognitions and awards, the first of which is a presentation of a proclamation proclaiming Children's Mental Health Awareness Week, May the 1st through the 7th, 2011. And uh, I'm the sponsor of this proclamation, so if uh, you'd indulge me, I'm going to read it from the microphone here. Whereas all children without regard to challenges they face are valuable and significant part of the rich and diverse resources of our present and our future, and whereas support for our youth as they grow and develop from cradle to career is essential to the success of children, families, and the community, and whereas mental health is essential to overall health and well-being, and whereas, according to the United States Department of Health and Human Services, one in five children has a mental health disorder and one in 10 adolescents aged 9 to 17 have a serious mental illness. And whereas, with proper treatment and support, children with mental health disorders can succeed in all life domains and reach their full potential moving from cradle to career. And whereas, as parents, doctors, and nurses, teachers, guidance, counselors, neighbors, friends, concerned citizens, and faith-based communities are among the many who can reach out to children, youth, and their families in our community who are in need of support, education, information, encouragement, and mental health services. And whereas community members can help establish safe and supportive communities that encourage and engage all young people regardless of their challenges to reach their full potential, and whereas strong youth and adult and young adults will strive to positively change the misconceptions about youth with the mental illness diagnoses to a vision of strong and capable young people who can overcome challenges, and whereas the Iredale County Board of County Commissioners joins with our mental health community and community organizations in recognizing the need to raise awareness about our children and mental health, commending those who work to support our youth and celebrate those children with mental health disorders who reach for their full potential. Now, therefore, the Iredale County Board of
County Commissioners hereby proclaims May 1st through May 7th, 2011 as Children's Mental Health Awareness Week in Iredell County, North Carolina, and commends its observance to our citizens. In witness thereof, I have hereto set my hand this 19th day of April in the year of our Lord, 2011, and is signed by myself, Stephen Johnson, Chairman. I believe we have a representative, Mr. Swan, here this evening. He was unable to come. If they'd come forth, we'll uh, present this proclamation to him. We'll move to appointments before the board. Pat Stewart, the United Way Education Grant Manager, de desires to speak regarding the Teachers Matters initiatives. Ms. Stewart, you come forward, please. <clears throat> Welcome. We're glad to have you this morning. Thank this you. Um, Tracy. Just, uh... Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um. Mr. Chairman and Mr. Mashburn and all of the commissioners, I do, and Bill, I do appreciate the opportunity to speak with you for a few moments uh, tonight. I recognize that your uh, field of service is broadly spread across many uh, issues and responsibilities of support for the people of our county and I just want to talk to you about one of those tonight and that is our public education. Um, most of you probably have heard that our United Way was one of 14 United Ways in the country um, in the three states of Florida, Tennessee and North Carolina that were selected to um, accept a grant that was issued by United Way Worldwide and funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to work in a grassroots effort in our community to um, further the, um, the characteristic of teacher effectiveness. And we all know that Education is of um, supreme importance, and um, from time to time, uh, there will be a focus, <clears throat> excuse me, on specific characteristics of public education. And it seems that now, government organizations, foundations um, that are interesting in in funding. Um, initiatives to improve public education um, and United Ways in general are all focused on the characteristic of teacher effectiveness. And so this grant was given to these 14 local communities really without many parameters or restrictions because they recognize that we know our communities best and that we could fashion this discovery process um, in a way that we felt would be successful and welcomed by the citizens of our communities. We began our study um, 
to identify best practices that are already in existence at uh, the Idle State School schools with a survey of our local teachers. We had um, a lot of research from around the country and throughout the state of North Carolina, but we wanted to see what our own teachers thought about um, effective teaching. And so that was our first uh, probe, and we had a result that we felt was really positive. We had 538 teachers to respond to that survey. And I want to give you an example of um, an outcome that we immediately achieved by just asking six short basic questions. One of those questions was, do you feel that you get adequate feedback to use for your improvement in becoming more effective in your classroom? 75% of those respondents answered yes, that they do. And so everybody felt pretty good about that. But then we challenged ourselves to look at the other 25%. Those are teachers that were saying, I want to do a great job. This is the career I've chosen, and I'm not really getting the constructive feedback that I would like for improvement. So in a year when the state of North Carolina had cut to zero all teacher mentoring funding, um, Brady Johnson, our superintendent, and his leadership team immediately went to work to become uh, creative in addressing that issue that we bought, brought to the forefront. And so without any funding, without any expenses, they recruited a teacher, a master teacher, at each school. So there is now a site-based mentoring program where teachers that want help, need help, they know where to go to ask for that help, and they have more frequent access um, by having that teacher right in their own school. Um, if you will follow me, I'm going to zip through this little presentation for you. But this, this is the presentation that I gave to our last uh, community coalition meeting, and that group is about 45 to 50 people from throughout um, Troutman, the upper end of Mooresville, um, Statesville, and northern Idaho County, east and west, who have joined us to study what it takes to be an effective teacher. And so, of course, this is um, a very uh, bold statement here, but our children really are our future. I think that we recognize that we focus on their future, but it really is our future also. Um, economically, when we're thinking about the students in the schools right now, uh, today's students are tomorrow's workforce. I think we all know that. Um, the majority of the teachers with Idaho State School schools right now the majority of them are Iredell County natives. And so thinking about that, we can say the 21,500 students that we're educating through ISS right now, they're going to be our teachers, or, or at least um, many of them will. They're also going to be our leaders. They are now our neighbors and will remain our neighbors. As our population is aging and we approach an age where someone else is going to have to care for us, these students are going to be our caregivers. And they are going to be who we are as a community. So this slide right here really um, is one that sort of encapsulates the importance of the work that we've been allowed to do. How well we educate our children influences 
our business environment, they're going to be our employees of tomorrow, and they're going to manage their own businesses, our social lives, the gang activity that we will experience in our communities, the students' success in life, and in reality, it's going to influence who we are as a community. Now, one of the best opportunities of getting this grant was that there was an encouragement from the Gates Foundation and from United Way Worldwide for us to look at our public schools and what they're doing and how they do it and what their success is and areas for improvement. But they also encouraged us to go out into the community and conduct listening sessions. And that has been one of our greatest successes. They didn't want us just to focus on traditional education stakeholders, as are you, people who care uh, intently about education, but they also wanted us to go out and talk to and listen to non-traditional stakeholders, and specifically disengaged parents of current students. As I began this work, I was a teacher right out of college here in Ardell County, and so immediately I got back into the feeling of I'm back in education now. Um, and I was so pleased as I began to work with Brady Johnson and his leadership team to realize how innovative and creative they are. Um, our school district is recognized nationally for those two characteristics. Um, they are committed, truly committed, to continuous improvement. When we had our first coalition kickoff meeting at Mitchell Community College, and I believe, Mr. Mitchell, that you were present there, uh, we had two representatives from Raleigh, uh, from the United Way of North Carolina, who joined us. And after the meeting was over, both of them came up to me and said, what an outstanding superintendent you have. And I'm shaking my head, yes, I know. And then they finished that sentence because he spoke for a little bit about some of the successes that they have experienced. But he spent the biggest part of his time talking about what we are yet not as successful with the, as we want to be. So at that time, before we got our most recent numbers from the state, we had 81% of our students at a proficiency level or above. But ISS leadership is focused on continuing that fine tradition but bringing that 19% up, that's where their real focus is. You see on this slide about uh, the I-3 federal grants, and there were almost 1,700 education institutions that applied for those competitive grants, 1,698. They gave out 46, and Ardell Statesville Schools was one of those. And when Arnie, Secretary Arnie Duncan called Brady Johnson, he said to the leadership team at ISS, what we're looking for is game-changing transformation. And they will get that from the work that ISS does. One of the most encouraging things that we learned from our survey of the teachers was that our teachers want more community involvement in the schools. They want that and they need it. And the other thing that just stands out as a highlight to me through these last 15 months is to witness and hear from the teachers how much they value learning from one another, 
collaborating, and ISS has in place many opportunities for that collaboration. The teachers want and need more. So we moved out and we started talking to parents. Parents, especially the ones that are not engaged, how many decades has it been that we've all been talking about the issue of lack of parental involvement? It's out there and we know it. I think it has appeared to be so big a problem that we've not known what to do. This coalition has decided we are going to make a dent in it. And then hopefully the next year, we'll hit it harder and make a bigger dent. Um, here are some of the ways that we are, are trying to do that. We went out and we had three listening sessions involving 60 parents that dropped out of school themselves. Most of them live in our uh, Statesville Housing Authority communities. Some of them are not. But I talked to parents ranging in age from 18 to 82 years old. All of them are studying right now to get their GED. I had to talk to those two people in that one group that were in their 80s. They are energetic about getting their GED. Um, and so we asked them to tell us about their education experience. Then after we listened to that, we said, how is it going with your own children? And that's when the room fell a little quiet because they began to talk about something that was dear to them. Keeping in mind, none of these are parents that darken the doors of their children's schools. It isn't because they don't care. They see themselves as failures. They valued our taking the time to come out and listen to their opinions. When I shared with them some of the results from the teacher's survey and the idea that if they would come to the schools, the teachers really want to partner with them, sort of a team teaching their children every year. On the sheets where they wrote impressions from our discussions, this is where the statement comes in their own words, thinking about partnering with my child's teachers gives me hope and they were serious. They also said things like, this lets us know y'all really do care about us. And there are a lot of us that care. You care a lot about every citizen in Ardell County. Sometimes we have to reach a little further to help them to see that. And that's what this opportunity has done for us. They want their children to succeed, and they know that they need help in making that happen. We ask the teachers, and we also ask parents, what do you think an effective teacher looks like? And this is what we heard. First of all, they have an encouraging and caring personality. Of course, they need to have a good knowledge of the subject that they're teaching. Here is a key one, that they have the ability to engage students in learning. I guess we don't like to think about it, but every day in every classroom, there are students present, but they're not learning. Some of them are not learning. Truly effective teachers have figured out something special that will get to each and every one of their students and they inspire them and they help them to believe that they can do the work. All effective teachers have high expectations 
of their students. And the students that we interviewed at the Boys and Girls Club from some of the poorest families in our community, you should have heard them talking about their favorite teachers. They are strict. They don't let us get by with anything. They tell us, you can do this work, and I'm going to show you how you can do it. They're not looking for an easy ride. They want to learn. And of course, we want all teachers to always be prepared. And then this last one, relationship building. And you know that this is true and probably in whatever business you're in. We all have to be skilled at building relationships to achieve whatever it is that we're trying to achieve. This is a picture of one of our um, students at Shepherd and his teacher. And I titled this picture, Recognizable Joy. They have a real connection, not just because their fingers are touching, but that is a child that has moved to our county somewhat recently and has found a home quickly because his teacher has built a relationship with him. That's what we want for all of our students. These next slides, I'm going to give you copies of these. I won't take the time to talk about them because I know your time is precious tonight. Ms. Stewart, if you could please begin to wind it up. We I have a am, number of people we need to hear from this evening. I'm, I'm going right there Thank right you, now. I'm going to leave you copies of these. This is what we're trying to avoid. A student was asked, what's your situation like in this classroom? Well, I raise my hand a lot because I want to answer. But the teacher never calls on me, only her few favorites. It's like I'm not even there. So in that class, my experience is a flat line instead of a heartbeat. I think that's very graphic. We don't ever want this to be the situation, but sometimes it is. Strategies for implementation, and this is how I'm wrapping up. I've already told you about the new teacher mentoring program. And by the way, the teachers that were recruited for that are proud to have been asked. Ireland State School Schools is implementing with the new school year a community classroom. Some communities call it a parent university. If the parents that are not engaged now will not come to the schools, community partners with the schools, like the Boys and Girls Club, the uh, Iredale Partnership for Young Children, um, and others, are going to go into neighborhood centers and offer some of this instruction to help them to understand what they do have to offer. We're creating a district-wide resource database. Every classroom teacher will be able to tell us what their needs are that will help them enhance their effectiveness, and we're going to work hard to recruit community support to give them that. The last piece is about professional development, and I'll close with this. Brady Johnson has read a book, maybe some of you have, it's called The Fred Factor. It's a small book, it's a quick read, you can probably read it in an hour's time. Fred was a postal service, a mailman. But he looked at every person he met in his personal life and his business life as his customer. And his passion for serving people turned his ordinary life into an extraordinary life. And so Mr. Johnson, in thinking that that spoke so well to building relationships with all of the students at ISS is now conducting a uh, principal study group on that book. And I would encourage you to get it and read it. Um, 
It's, it's an outstanding book by Mark Sanborn. I want to thank you for your, your time to listen tonight and remind you that the first week of May is National Teacher Appreciation Week and hope that you'll find time to thank a teacher or two. Thank you, you ma'am. Mm -hmm. Next, we have under points for the board, Mr. John Perry, Troutman resident, desires to speak about solid waste fees and mobile home parks. Mr. Perry, welcome, sir. Thank you. Happy day after tax day. Yeah. Uh, I'm here to talk about the solid waste fee at uh, vacant mobile home lots. Uh, we're charged $40.50. I'm a park owner, by the way, uh, per year, per lot even if they're vacant. And some of these parks, mine included, have had vacant lots for years and we're being charged this fee. Uh, fee is charged, but there's no service being rendered. It's called an availability fee. And there's a lot of jokes about availability fees. I thought I'd tell you one, but I decided against it. If you've heard some, I don't think you want me to say it. Uh, the mobile home sales are down, repossessions are up, and financing is very difficult to get. So our businesses are being squeezed from both sides, the higher costs and lower demand. The rental lots are not like campsites, apartments, rental houses. They're, they have a different character. Mobile homes stay vacant for years because and if they if they stay if they come to your park they stay for years because the cost of moving them is rather prohibitive so they stay there if the house is there you should be charging a fee for availability or for the solid waste fees that's not a problem even if just like an apartment or a rental house if the house is there whether it's rent or not that's not your concern you have the service available however if the lot is vacant in a mobile home park, there's no one there to service, no matter how hard you try. And Mooresville is going to enact a recycling fee. They supposedly asked around probably two or three people, and they said, yeah, we want to do this, and we'll, we're willing to pay for it. Well, they didn't ask anyone in my park, which is 44 families, well, 39 families, I should say. That's about $39 a year for, per family. And I'm sure they're going to use your model as an availability fee charge. I've already talked to the commissioners there. They haven't decided on what to do yet, but I think they would probably follow your lead. I would hope that we can change this. Uh, that's the problem. I've also brought you a solution. I think this is kind of a rare thing. Uh, there's several ways the tax office has to monitor available of, of occupied mobile home lots. Annually, the mobile home park owners fill out a form listing all the owners for tax purposes. They have that list there, so therefore they know who's there. And in my case, I have 39 occupied lots and there are five empties. Uh, so they have that list. Now there's a possibility that someone could move into the park during the year. Okay, in order to move into the park, you have to go to the zoning office in Mooresville and pay a redundant fee in Statesville at the zoning office to get the permits to put the park or the uh, mobile home in the park. At that point, the zoning office could charge a prorated fee and it could be put right into the uh, zoning fee. So that covers any partial years that might come up. And thirdly, you have GIS maps. And at the end of the year, the tax office can look at the GIS maps. They can look at the list and see if there's any incongruities and figure it out. 
and the tax office just has to get the report from the zoning department. So that that's the problem and that's the solution, I would think. Uh, we're just asking that uh, you revise the current fee procedure to provide a more equitable procedure. And I've got five more minutes to talk, but I won't do it. <laughs> okay. Thanks, sir. Anyone have any questions, Mr. Baird? I guess not. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This time, we'll declare the meeting to be in a public hearing in regard to consideration of a resolution allowing the transportation director to submit a Section 5310 elderly and disabled grant application to the North Carolina Department of Transportation. Mr. Garrison. Thank you. Uh, the purpose of this is to hold a public hearing on the uh, proposed FTA Section 53 um, grant application for elderly and disabled. Uh, the action required would be to adopt a resolution. Uh, also, part of the process is to hold a public hearing for the uh, citizen input. Uh, the ap application for this grant was actually due yesterday, and I submitted the application. Uh, it would be considered a Category B application until we ha actually hold a public hearing, so the funding would be held. Uh, the period of performance on this grant is two years uh, from uh, July 1st of 11 through the end of June of, of 2013. Um, rural transit across the state is concerned about the possibility of the Rural Operating Assistance Program funding being cut, and we've heard estimates that that funding uh, cuts could be as high as 39 uh, percent. Um, if that would happen, most rural transit systems would probably have no alternative than to cut service. And the concern we have is that we live in a time where we need to be providing service primarily to our elderly and disabled. Uh, some of the target groups that we would target through this grant would be uh, Dallas's transportation, uh, some services to the developmentally disabled, and also use uh, this uh, grant for uh, medical transportation to transport people both in county and out of county, such as the VA hospital. Uh, the grant would be for $155,824. It's a 50% federal and 50% local match. And we do use our rope funding as the local match for these grants. So, the ability to provide the service, of course, then is going to be contingent on how much rope funds we're able to uh, draw down. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions, Mr. Garrison? If the rope funding goes away, will the county be required to replace that funding? No. So none of this grant match has to come from the county? No. It's, it's all from, from, we use rope funds and then some of the, uh, it's reduced by passenger fares. If you're given the grant and 75000 comes from the federal and then the rope funding goes away completely, will you be required to give that money back to the federal government? Actually, we don't receive the money. We have to invoice after the fact. So we're providing the service using the rope money and then we're billing for the, for the, uh, the 5310 money. Okay. So... We, we would have to cut service. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in regard to this? If not, the request before the board is the uh, is a resolution that we need to adopt. Is that right, Mr. Garrison? That's correct. Doors open for a motion. Motion to adopt the resolution section 5310. Motion for approval or adoption, excuse me, by Vice Chairman Norman. Any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Garrison. Thank you. Uh, we have the next item consideration of a resolution 
align the transportation director submit a federal transit administration job access and reverse commute grant application to the North Carolina Department of Transportation. Basically the same uh, parameters apply to this grant. It just has a different, different purpose. Um, again, I've already submitted the application and it's in a category B status. Um, job access reverse commute grants really target transportation or employment transportation to persons with low income. Um, we use it to transport to employment sites, but we also use it to transport people that have been displaced from jobs that are returning to the community college for uh, continuing their education. Just as an idea of how much we provide with this uh, particular grant, um, in the first eight months of this fiscal year, we provided 19,672 employment trips in, in Iredell County. So employment transportation is becoming one of our leading requests for service in, in what we do. Uh, this grant is for $208,806. Again, it's a, uh, a two-year period of performance. Of, it has a 50-50 match, and we, again, use our rope funding as the local match for this, for this particular grant. We be happy to answer any questions. Okay, any questions, Mr. Garrison? What is your current fee that you charge for transportation? Your $2. current fee? Two dollars per trip. Is that any two dollars per trip anywhere in the county? Well, if you live in extreme parts of the county, it would be four dollars. Most of the trips that we provide, though, are within the two dollar range. We've we've got the county in in zones, uh, but most of our service would be in the the two dollar range. And you have a huge territory to cover, and I admire you for what you get done. So, yeah. sir. I said, you have a huge territory to cover, and I just want to thank you for doing the good job that you all do over there. Well, thank you. It, it is a big county. Okay, any other questions? Is there anyone else who speaks in regard to, wish to speak in regard to this? If not, the request again is for adoption of a resolution. <coughs> Floor is open for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move for adoption. Motion to adopt the resolution from Mr. Mitchell. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Kerry. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Mashburn, we're down to administrative matters. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to call on Tracy Jackson to present the first two items on the agenda. One, a request from the Fire Operations Committee and the other is a sublease agreement pertaining to a communications tower. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board. I'm here tonight to uh, present an idea from the uh, Fire Operations Planning Committee. It's really a statement, and it reads as follows. Uh, the developer of any major subdivision, as defined by the current Iredell County Land Development Ordinance, which after review causes a negative impact on the ISO rating of the service district, shall be required to mitigate any negative impact by implementing measures to maintain the current ISO rating of the fire district. Now, to give you a little further explanation on this, the committee has done some, uh, some very uh, good work over the period of time that it's been, been meeting. Uh, we've really looked at funding issues. Uh, there's been a lot of concern about the what-ifs for the future in terms of funding for the fire service. Uh, one of those issues had to do with the possibility that Lake Norman Volunteer Fire Department might pull out at some point in the future from the countywide fire tax district. Um, I think the committee and, and others have played a key role in trying to address that. And one of the other issues that sprung from the committee in discussion, and it's been a big area of focus for us, is what about the future in terms of maintaining insurance ratings? The fire departments have worked very hard to get to where they're at to be able to improve their fire insurance ratings and to therefore decrease the premiums to homeowners and business owners in the county. And they want to see uh, some effort in the future to be able to maintain those ratings or perhaps even continue to improve those ratings as the county grows. So what we bring to you tonight is just this simple statement. It's fairly broad, but it's uh, intended just to generate some conversation, some discussion 
about those needs that may be coming along the road there in the future. Okay. Any other questions? We have Mr. Nolan Shoemaker here tonight who actually chaired that committee. Do you have anything you'd like to add to that, Mr. Shoemaker? This was probably the topic that g generated more discussion and debate than any other. Wouldn't you agree, Mr. Jackson? We were there for a good while discussing this yeah. and the possibilities and, and what may be done and uh, what's realistic and what's maybe not realistic. Okay. Mr. Roberts, you were there. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, I would. Uh, I'd like to, to thank Chief Shoemaker for his leadership and the, and the time that he spent tackling that difficult issue. It was it's no easy task, and these guys uh, in our, our volunteer fire service, they spend an awful lot of time preparing so that they can get certified and licensed and anointed and all the different things that they have to do just so that they can answer the call at 2 in the morning when the rest of us are in bed. And this was just an, uh, an, additional, uh, uh, an additional task that, that, we, that we asked him to do. And, uh, and he stepped up and led. So, thank you, thank you very much. And this is a this is a very simple, not a bunch of hitherto's and witherfores and legalese. It's pretty plain spoken. Uh, these fire departments have worked incredibly hard. This county in, has invested a significant amount of money to get these fire ratings improved. And what we want to do is keep them that way. So, thank you very much. Sir. Simply stated, but not so easily arrived at. Wouldn't you agree? No, with I that? would agree with that. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Who will monitor if a subdivision is going to cause a negative impact to the community? We discussed that in the committee, and there are some different options in terms of county departments that would need to work together. Uh, it could be from zoning to fire marshal's office. Um, perhaps it would even involve some of the local private water companies. Just really depends on what we're talking about in terms of uh, trying to mitigate any growth that could uh, impact the fire rating. And what type of thing would a subdivision do that would cause a negative impact? Could you give me an example on an ISO rating? Depending on the number of homes, the size of homes, uh, the density of the subdivision, whether it's served with water or if they're on well water, uh, accessibility to hydrants. I mean, there's an, there are a number of things that impact the ISO ratings, but water is a big one and access to water. Do you foresee this potentially causing us to have to create a department or hire additional staff to monitor this? You know, it depends a lot, I think, on the size of the growth or the amount of growth we have in the county. I don't see, you know, uh, from this point, and it's hard to tell, you know, how rapidly the county might grow. Uh, in the future, uh, having to form a whole new department, uh, I think there's I don't see that. You know, enough staff at the onset to be able to monitor this and to be able to use uh, methods, procedures that are already in place. So, can't promise that you won't need some extra staff in the future, but right. for now. We do preclude that to some degree by limiting it to a major subdivision. So anytime anybody right. builds a small subdivision does not rise, rise to the level of a major subdivision, they won't be affected by this. It's, uh, it's primarily going to be somebody who builds a home in an area of a service district that is in the corner of a district, barely in it, with limited water, limited access of water. And, you know, I'm as reluctant to anybody to tell somebody they can't build anywhere. But you could conceivably have one subdivision who could, who could come into a service district after that fire department and the taxpayers in that existing district have spent out tens of thousands of dollars to get their insurance rating. And one subdivision could come in there and ruin the whole rating. I, think, I, I don't know that allowing him to exercise his freedom at the expense of everyone else is a, is a fair thing to do. I think that's a fair statement, and I think that uh, pretty pretty well summarizes where the uh, the fire departments have concerns. 
for the future. Okay. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. What is the definition of a major subdivision by our land development ordinance at this point? Um, I may have to refer to somebody in the planning department or zoning department to help us out with that. Ten lots or more, or it, it can be smaller if there's a road involved, new road involved, but it's basically over ten lots. Why you at the mic? Go ahead. I didn't mean I'm that. done. Thank you. Why you at the microphone, Mr. Smith? You said it would probably best to incorporate this into the ordinance as far as your 2030 plan. I uh, recall. Yeah, I, I think it would have to be. Uh, otherwise, there'd be no way to stop or limit those subdivisions from actually getting approved before this review goes forward. Okay. So uh, we would have to probably take the, the language here and, uh, and insert it in the land development code before it gets adopted. Okay. Would the developer be given an opportunity to modify their plans to, to meet the oh, yeah. rating? That's the whole idea. Whole in, the, idea. In, the, in the word mitigate, that gives him options. He can Stand on his head and spit nickels if that'll solve the problem. I just I hate to see more things. You know, I, I understand the argument on the fire department side and the county side because there have been a lot of money spent and a lot of time and effort. I also hate to see us potentially put things in place that could hinder growth. And But thank you for, your, for answering this question. Thank you very much. Okay. I mean, some of the stuff, I mean, this is for the protection of the community. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is for the protection of the, com of the citizens. I mean, they, they, they're the one who've been paying the fire tax. Yeah. That bought the fire truck, that bought the fire hose, that got the insurance rating down. And they've got their insurance down because they've spent the money on the front end. Somebody comes in, does a type of development that harms that insurance rating, so everybody's home insurance goes up because... What's it allowed him to do? And, you know, I was, I was overcome by that argument as compared to letting anybody do anything. I, yeah. Like making the road wide enough so that the fire trucks can get down it. Yeah, that's, that could be it. That yeah. could be all they need. So, I mean, who, you know, the people in that neighborhood are better served by, by this. And Mr. Jackson, you, you're not one to brag on yourself, but you did a lot of fact-finding on that committee yourself and gathered a lot of information. We appreciate your service on that committee as well. Thank you. We appreciate uh, as well your service and the service of uh, Commissioner Robertson on that committee also. Okay. So uh, the request you have is uh, I'm going to interpret the request like this, that this uh, – this be included in the 2030 plan as, as it relates to subdivisions. Is that a correct way to say it? I'd say the, the land development code. Right. So okay. 2030. So that's the request we have before you. Is the floor open for a motion? So move. Motion by Mr. Mitchell. Any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? <laughs> motion carries unanimously. Okay, Mr. Jackson, you're still here. Go ahead, Mr. Mashburn. I keep trying to take this. Mr. Your Jackson job. has it. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next item is a sublease agreement uh, for a uh, statewide communications systems tower. So basically, what this does, it allows our responders to connect into the state system and communicate locally. You know, if there was a major disaster. They could not only uh, be able to talk here throughout the county on those radios, they could also go to other places or even communicate while they're en route to other places within North Carolina. Um, the state's been working on this system for a number of years. Mm -hmm. They helped to fund it with uh, Homeland Security money uh, post 9-11, and they've been growing the system slowly over time. Part of the way they do that is by partnering with uh, local governments, and in this situation, uh, this does benefit us because not only can we communicate on our local, regional, and statewide basis, but we can also add equipment onto their tower that they're proposing to, uh, to build on Fox Mountain. So that gives us some extra 
redundancy in terms of our communication system. Okay, any questions? If not, floor is open for a motion. It, it doesn't state here, but I guess the action request is just to approve the, sub, the 10 year sublease agreement? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So moved. Okay, motion by Mr. Robertson for approval of this request. Any discussion? Not all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. The uh, item C is a request from the Health Department, <coughs> and Susan Johnson, Director of Nursing at the Health Department, will make that presentation. We received notification um, recently that we would be um, eligible for $16,093 in additional Title X bonus funds. And um, I'm here tonight to request a budget amendment for that amount so that we can use that money to perform five tubal ligations. These Title X bonus funds come in typically um, in about February each year. We get notified when the state starts looking at how money is being spent and what might not be spent, they start kind of reallocating it. And, um, and we are notified. And a couple years ago, we made arrangements, as we were encouraged to do by the state, to have contracts in place and a waiting list for women that would like to have their tubes tied that would otherwise not be able to do that. So we have done that proactively, and um, we have five women lined up to have their tubes tied if this is approved. You have questions? How many women are currently on the list? We have 26 on the list. What's the longest any woman has been waiting? Um, probably less than a year. I, I don't know the exact amount of time, but I'm sure it's been less than a year. We did receive some funds in December and were able to do three or four um, at that time, and then we received funds last year as well. Okay, any other questions? If not, floor is open for a motion. <coughs> motion to approve budget minimum number 38. Motion to approve budget minimum number 38 from Vice Chairman Norman. Any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Our finance director, Susan Blumenstein, will present item D and E. And these relate also to budget amendments. Thank you. Uh, budget amendment number 39 is being presented to allocate some or appropriate some additional fund balance in the workers' compensation self-insurance fund. Um, early in this year, we did have to um, use $125,000 of what we had budgeted for claims for a negotiated settlement. At this point, we need additional funds appropriated to make it and pay our bills for April, May, and June. Um, following this appropriation, which is I'm um, requesting $70,000 to finish out the year, our fund balance will remain over $900,000 in that self-insurance fund. Okay. Any questions? Is that remaining amount a healthy amount, or is that real good or not real good? I feel comfortable with that amount because it's two years. You know, we we budgeted about 426, I believe. No, excuse me, 476. So we're not quite two years um, costs that we'll have this year remaining in fund balance. We could always have an extraordinary year, but since we moved into self-insuring our workers' comp, we have saved a lot of money. I'm comfortable with that. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Hearing none, the floor is open for a motion. Mr. Chair, I move for uh, approval of budget amendment number 39. Motion for approval, budget amendment number 39 from Mr. Mitchell. Any discussion on his motion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. The next item is um, a request to appropriate the funds that we did set aside as in a contingency line item this year specifically for fuel. 
just like every other business and individual in Iredell County, we have had unprecedented cost in our fuel since January. Um, our fees that were our cost for diesel is up 55% on a per gallon rate since the 1st of July, and we do not have to pay the federal and state transportation taxes. Our regular unleaded gasoline is up 51% per gallon. We've used over 220,000 gallons of fuel since the 1st of July. The majority of those costs, 58% of those costs, are in the Sheriff's Department. But that office has reduced their daily use by about 6% since this time last year. So I'd ask that you allow me to move this $100,000 out into our departments so that they can make it through the rest of the year. Part of these funds, um, or excuse me, I'm not having to request any of these funds be used in EMS, although that's where I'm, the majority of our diesel is used, because this year we have had the best year ever in debt set off on old ambulance bills, so I'm going to request or recognize some of that revenue we've received to support that department in their fuel cost. Any questions, Ms. Blumenstein? Uh, I have one, but it's, it's not necessarily about this amendment, but about kind of looking forward. I just did a few rough calculations here. In, in ballpark, we, we had budgeted about $500,000 or so for fuel this year, and then we put $100,000 in a contingency fund so, so that means that this year we're basically we're going to spend about six hundred thousand dollars on fuel, mm -hmm. roughly. As we look, and I know y'all are putting together the budget. Last year we we budgeted five hundred thousand. We put a hundred thousand in contingency. That means that we had about a twenty percent contingency. But we plan our contingency fund was about twenty percent of the total. So if you assume that the baseline of fuel prices that we have now are going to be a, a, about where we enter in July, and I, I suspect they'll be higher, um, are y'all planning to, to make our baseline funding about 600000 and then appropriate another 20% of 600000 as a contingency for next year? Or, or, or do you think that we probably ought to up that contingency amount for next year in case we actually see $5 a gallon fuel like they're predicting. When we this developed song. our budget this year, we, at, we instructed the departments to budget for an, a 32% increase in their departments. In addition, um, at this point, we haven't finalized our budget, but I have um, put another 100000 in a contingency on top of the 32% increase in the departments. It says 58% of this fuel is used by the Sheriff's Department, so there's 42% being used by the rest of the, the departments. Do you know what percentage of that 42% is EMS? I'm sorry, I didn't bring it That's with fine. me, and I have not moved. Some departments are going to be okay. Uh, the assessor's office or reappraisal. I'm not having to ask for additional funding there. I believe vehicle services is one that's going to be okay. Recreation is one that's going to be okay. And I, I'm, I apologize. I didn't think to bring like a pie chart. Is there any way that we can look at reducing the, the amount of the gas used? The sheriff's department has reduced it by 6%. I mean, are, there, are we looking at some of those measures as well rather than just budgeting more money? Everybody's spending more on gas. I mean, that's the reality of where we are. I, I do understand that. And the departments have been very good. They, they're they not making unnecessary trips. I know one of the things that at the Sheriff's Department that they implemented early into this fiscal year was they don't just ride patrol all night. They park in strategic locations so they're not just riding the road all night long to try to, to save on fuel. Um, but that, that has its downside in that it cuts down the visibility of them being in the community. Yeah. But, you know, 
you, there's got to be a trade-off somewhere. Mm-hmm. That's right. And because of ethanol, you're not getting as good a gas mileage as you used yeah. to get. <laughs> the money that's seized by the sheriff's department, that cannot be used to offset fuel costs, no. can it? Cannot be used no. to offset some of okay. I don't think you could get that imagined. It, I believe it would be considered supplanting what the county yeah. normally provides Probably. for operations, you know. Okay. Um, I, I can I can support this budget amendment, and it, and it sounds like if if y'all are if y'all are telling put thirty two percent on, and then you're doing another. You're not your contingency wouldn't be twenty percent more, but if you're telling them to to assume a 32% rise over the 600. Yes, that's correct. Then I guess that's as good of a guess as, as anybody could make. Yep. Okay. All right, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I'll make the motion that we approve budget amendment number 40. 40. Okay, motion for approval of budget amendment number 40 for Mr. Robertson. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike Phillips with the Sheriff's Department will present a request to apply for some uh, funds from the Governor's Highway I Safety I hope you program. walked over here. <laughs> <laughs> from the parking space, it's yes, like, sir, I did. Right. <laughs> um, this, uh, what we're asking for is um, consent to apply for the Governor's Highway Safety Program grant. This is actually a continuation grant. Well, this will be our third year in the traffic grant. Uh, that's what this is. Um, this will be our third and final year in that grant. Um, the total amount of the grant will be $101,523. There is a 50% match this year. Um, and we'll, it'll be $50,761.50 and we'll use uh, asset forfeiture funds to pay that match. Captain Phillips, will this include, do we have to hire anybody for this? We've already hired two. We've got two people on this grant. So. And, and are we obligated to pay them when this grant ends? Yes. And the sheriff anticipates putting them into the regular budget. Of course, we'll see where that goes. When does our obligation end to keep them employed? I'm sorry. When does the obligation end to keep them employed? Is there a time if the grant was three years, are we obligated to keep them employed for an additional three months. years? One year. Okay. Okay. Floor's open for a motion. Motion to approve the grant. Motion to approve the grant from Mr. Norman. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Oh, aye. 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 All opposed? No. Well, I, I did have at this, a, a little discussion. I'm sorry. N I, I'm n not going to change my my vote, but pretty much we've said all along that when the when the funding runs out for these positions, then and, and we're obligated to fund them for that extra year, then I guess we're obligated to fund them for that extra year. But after that. Um, I, th I think we really, really, really have to take a hard look to see is this, is this something that we really have got to have because e everybody's just getting pinched. So not, not meaning to rain on the parade, but. Right. The, the problem we're running into, Mr. Phillips, is it's bad. And we're just not seeing any evidence that's going to get better anytime soon. I understand. But we do appreciate you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, the next item, item G, is a, a request to approve the March uh, 2011 tax refunds and releases. Uh, the releases for the month of March uh, totaled uh, $18,559.20 and uh, for the county, um, and uh, the refunds for March was one thousand seven dollars and five cents for the county. Okay. 
Floor's open for a motion for approval. So moved. Motion by Mr. Robertson. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next item is a request uh, to approve a, a resolution opposing any attempt by the state to reduce county revenues for capital school capital needs or to shift additional costs to the counties. And Commissioner Griffith um, is the sponsor of that resolution. Mr. Chairman, I think that it's important that the community know the extent in which this board supports our public schools and the dollar amount that we do that. I think it's also important that the community realize what uh, the thought process is and what we are facing on this end and potentially what the governor is asking counties to pick up and the impact that that will have to this community, to this county, to every single taxpayer. And uh, I strongly support this resolution and would request that we adopt it and that we sign it and that it be sent to every single member of the that represents us at the state as well as the governor and I will be happy to read the resolution for the record if you would please whereas counties are statutorily responsible for providing public school facilities in North Carolina and contribute significant county funds for classroom expenses and whereas counties spend more than 1.5 billion annually for public school capita, capital needs and $2.5 billion for public school operating expense. In Iredell County alone, we spend more than $37.3 million annually for the public school capital needs plus $36.6 million annually for public school operating expenses and $3.9 million annually for community college capital needs and operating expenses. And whereas the counties, continue, counties rely on local sales tax, property taxes, the county share of lottery funds and the county share of corporate income tax to help fund public school capital needs, and we have issued public debt based on these revenue streams, and whereas counties have lost more than a quarter billion dollars in lottery and corporate income tax school construction funds over the current biennium, and Iredell County alone has lost more than $2 million in lottery and corporate income tax school construction funds. And whereas the governor's budget proposed permanently, proposal permanently eliminates the county's share of the corporate income tax and reduces the county's lottery share by 75%, costing Iredell County almost $2.8 million per year more than the $27.7 million per year in revenues dedicated to public school construction needs. And whereas the budget proposal shifts responsibilities to pay for replacement school buses to counties would cost approximately $640,000 for Iredell County. And whereas the budget proposal also takes the unprecedented step of forcing counties to assume the workers' compensation cost for state-paid public at school employees, $34.6 million per year, which would annually cost Iredell County $562,000, and community college employees, $1.7 million per year, which would create a cost to Iredell County of $45,770, and also to fund school tort claims in the tune of $4.6 million per year, costing Iredell County $170,000. Whereas the budget proposal reflects an overall cost shift to the counties of $345 million in 2011 and 12 alone, requiring counties to raise property taxes to manage a loss of this magnitude. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Iredell County Board of Commissioners adamantly opposes the unfunded mandates and the losses of county revenue included in the governor's budget proposal, and be it further resolved that copies of this resolution be transmitted to the members of the General Assembly to let them know of the opposition to these unprecedented changes in county responsibility and the use of county revenues to balance the state budget. Adopted this day, April, 19th day of April, 2011. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Ms. Griffith. Any discussion on this uh, resolution? Hearing not, uh, there is a motion for adoption. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Griff. The next item is uh, put on there for you to discuss an initiative that has come 
as a recommendation for the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners. Recently, Co Commissioner Griffith and myself attended the district meeting of the association in Wilkesboro, and one of the uh, items that came out of that meeting was uh, a request uh, and encourage meetings uh, with our legislators prior to the, the assembly day, which is scheduled for May the 25th, I believe, uh, and they're encouraging that um, each county meet at some point in time between now and then with, uh, with our legislator just to discuss the county's position on several bills that impact the uh, legislative goals that were established by the association. Uh, those goals are attached, and, um, I, and I don't want to speak for Mrs. Griffith, but I believe she did indicate that she would be willing to facilitate such a meeting. Uh, with our legislators and working with the staff to put something together on that. I, I would be willing to do that if the board is willing to have a date and um, look at facilitating this. I believe the legislators in Raleigh were hired to balance the budget or they were elected to hire, they were elected to balance the budget and to control spending just like we are. I think we need to make our voices heard that the people in this county are tired of being taxed they don't want any more taxes and they want spending under control we want them to do their job and uh, in as nice a way as possible with a smile on my face I'll be happy to facilitate that a meeting and have a meeting here in our county yes sir okay. ask them to come to this county and it's the present time that they're in session so we'll have to meet on Monday or Friday is that right I believe so yes sir okay Okay, do we have any possible dates? I'd be glad to come, but. There's, there's not a recommended date at this time. As, as okay. uh, Commissioner Norman said, uh, it would, it would ha have to be a weekend or a, a, Friday, uh, a Friday evening or a weekend because most of the time, and, and you can help us with this, but I think normally you go down on Monday uh, and uh, come back on Thursday night, so Friday, and, and if they're in business or have a profession, then usually Friday is the only day they've got to do that. So it's probably going to be either a Friday late or a, um, a weekend. You're going to have a difficult time getting them now just for late in the budget year. So they're, they're swamped right now with emails, phone calls, lines outside their office when they go to a committee meeting and come back. I mean, it's like running a gauntlet. Well, I would be happy to take the concerns of this board and address them by telephone to our representatives instead of a, a, an actual county assembly day. I will facilitate this however I can to accommodate the board and our legislatures. You'll, you'll get just as much good off phone calls as you will trying to meet with them because you won't have half of them. You won't have a third of them here. since we pay their salaries. I catch them on cell phones when they're riding back and forth. So. We can table this if, if the board would like to discuss this at a different time, or um, I'll be happy to help facilitate this any way that I can. I mean, I, I think we all agree on yeah. this, on, on, on these. I don't think there's any discussion there okay. at all. You know, I've, I've been fussing for for a couple of years now, it, and some of them are our delegation. They, you know, they, they always want to give a break on, on county taxes. Yeah. I tell them, hey, if you want to cut people's taxes, that's great. You just cut state taxes. Leave our revenues alone. We can't go and give people breaks on your state tax rate. I, why you feel you need to give people a break on county tax rate? So, and then as far as shifting responsibilities to counties and that's that'd be easy if uh you know the fed, feds are going to push down to the states states push down to the counties we don't have anybody to push to except the taxpayers so um i've shared i've shared my thoughts with uh dr forrester who's our state senator with gray mills and the, and the rest of them you're welcome to join as well I was on the phone with one this afternoon at 2.15, walked out of the house session and called me and said to talk about closing the Mooresville 
dean or office that's out right now so we're back on so, I mean, oh. they're, they're working for us down there right now yeah. believe me they are there's a, there's a lot of rumors going around that aren't so and some of them are, are true but uh, it's not time to panic just yet the house is doing their budget then it goes over to the senate then the senate sends it back and then then it's when it's time to panic <laughs> well, I'm not panicked, but I believe in a, um, sending a unified okay. message from this board and uh, would not want to communicate a message to our legislatures that is not in support of this board. The, the well, only other thing I would add that's not in here is, is again, I've been beating this drum for a couple of years. The only way that we can cut our budgets is if they change the rules that mandate that we spend the money. It's very difficult to cut education budgets when they dictate and demand that certain services are provided by the school system. So you can say, well, we cut edu, you know, we, we, you know, we'll just cut their budget, but the problem is, is if they still have all these requirements to fund that stuff, that's, that's the the problem if we gave them the freedom to spend the, the, the school board Department of Social Sur Services the health department if they had the freedom and the latitude to make the decisions about how they spend their money yep. and what they're not going to spend it on then then they could probably survive some of the reductions that are coming their way so that's the only other thing I would add is if they're going to cut the budget they need to cut the rules mr. Or chairman cut the re requirements. Could I could I modify? I don't know how that works. So can I make a modification to this, or does it need to be removed and then represented? I apologize that I don't that, know the procedure. Fine. There's no problem. I, I was going to say the only thing I've got a problem with is enhanced river basin monitoring <laughs> and streamlined rulemaking. That sounds really good. Yeah. Most likely it's damaging. <laughs> Most likely, it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. So when we say we want them to cut spending, and then we turn around and we want to enhance river basin monitoring and streamline rule rulemaking, we've just contradicted ourselves. Well, just for clarification, these were the um, goals that the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners voted on. I attended that meeting. I understand. And, um, this That's is the most conservative group you've ever been to. No, it is well, not. they're more so now. Yes, they are. Well, I've never been under the illusion that everybody <laughs> belonged to the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners had good sense. Yeah. <laughs> I've sat in a room with a lot of them. A lot of them are just not real smart. And from my understanding, when I attended the, um, the meeting with uh, Mr. Mashburn, was that we could choose the items that we wanted to... Right talk to our legislatures about well you mind doing some homework no sir I do not mind. okay won't you see if you could if you would I would request that you get a consensus from this board which of these measures they would like be included in a letter all right and uh, you can do that and you can craft the letter to your pleasure and ask miss Moore to Put it in the form, and we'll sign it and send it to them. Okay. Okay. Is that fair enough? Okay. But thank you for your effort. I appreciate you going to that meeting, and I appreciate you staying on top of things. I truly want to. We all want to do what we can. Yes, ma'am. We all want to do what we can. And the last time under the administrative matters is approval, your request to approve the uh, April 5, 2011 minutes. Motion okay. to approve. Thank you, Mr. Norman. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Unanimous uh, next item, announcements of vacancies occurring on boards and commissions. Adult Care Home Community Advisory Committee. We have one announcement. Industrial and Facilities and Pollution Control Financing Authority. We have two announcements. And next, we move to appointments to boards and commissions. Adult Care Home Community Advisory Committee. We have two appointments. The floor is open for nomination. Motion to table. Motion to table for Mr. Robertson. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Let's see it. 
Unfinished business. Is there any unfinished business to come to our attention? Public comment period. New business. County manager's report. Mr. Chairman, only a couple of items that, okay. uh, that I have. Uh, first of all is um, just to remind you that county offices will be closed uh, this Friday, uh, as will the state offices and the, and the town offices. Um, and the other thing, I just uh, I, I was hoping by this time to give you a better report on the, uh, the progress we're making on the animal services building, but uh, due to some delay in a, uh, materials and, and other factors, including the weather, um, there has been a, a, a delay on that, so it appears that uh, substantial completion will not be until this, between the first and the mid part of June. Um, there's a lot been done, but there's still a lot that's left to be done. And uh, our experience over the years has been a lot of times that a lot of activity at the beginning of the project and things go real well. And then somewhere along the line, if there's a delay that takes them off of the job for any reason, uh, then it's hard to get them back on the job. And that's uh, kind of what's happened here. Although they, they've been on the job, it's, uh, there's been some delays in materials and so forth, uh, and, and as well as the weather. Okay. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Any questions of the manager? If not, we deleted the closed session for the an order. A motion for adjournment is in order. So move. So move. Mr. Norman makes a motion for adjournment. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries unanimous. Morgan, you